of this, uh, the second in our series of webinars on fire prevention plans, um, provided to you by Unomia Research and Consulting. In the first, we provided an overview of the new requirements and what compliance looks like. But in the second one, uh, we'll give you a slightly different perspective. We'll give you a firefighter's perspective on fire prevention plans. We're joined today uh, by Phil Pinches. Um, Phil has uh, had a 31-year career as a firefighter in South Wales. He's been an incident commander at many different types of fire, including uh, waste fires. And he's been working closely with you know, on the fire prevention plan training that we've been delivering in Wales. And we're also joined by Sophie Crosswell, who is uh, our in-house expert on um, many aspects of planning and permitting, and who's been closely involved in delivering the training we've been doing and in preparing fire prevention plans uh, for our clients in England. So the idea today is we'll, we'll interview uh, Phil and, and Sophie. Um, we'll be covering um, issues including uh, access to water supply, uh, pile sizes, site access, and how you address sensitive receptors. Um, but please do submit your questions as we go through, um, and uh, we'll capture those and we'll put those to the, the panel, um, and we'll go on for up to an hour. But as long as we have uh, as long as we have questions, basically. So. Without further ado, let's um, let's get on and, and ask some some questions. So, Phil, perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about how big an issue um, waste fires have been for the fire service in recent times. Okay, yeah, um, particularly in South Wales, from my experience, um, we were having one maybe one every month, every couple of months. Um, I think in the, in, the, in a three-year period. Um, we had a significant number, and the last year I was in, in, in the fire service, we had three or four major fires, ma major ones of, uh, in the South Wales area, uh, including some in, in the West West Wales area with the uh, West Wales uh, fire service. And uh, the thing is, with these with the incidents, okay, uh, once they start, they take a, a long time to, to address. Uh, they draw a lot of um, resources from the respective fire services. Um, you know, up to up to 10, 20 appliances, and if you consider that in the in the you know, within the, the South Wales area, for example, that they may, they may be delays in uh, responding to other more life-threatening incidents within, within the South Wales area. So it does a, have a major impact, and obviously there's a cost implication, and also there's the, 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 the danger of injury caused to firefighters. Um, going back to an uh, incident in West Midlands uh, a number of years ago, um, it's quite a large fire caused by... Um, caused by um, Lighted. Yes, yeah, so it was Chinese lantern. Though. Chinese lantern, that's right. And uh, I think 10 firefighters went to hospital. I mean, you know, and they, they would have received a varying degrees of injuries, but then, again, it, it adds to the resource drain on, on mm -hmm. the fire service resources. So, you're, in South Wales, you were helping support other fire services around um, your neighbouring areas, and that, all that draws uh, firefighting resources away. Where they might otherwise be with it. Exactly, we've got uh, within Wales and, and the rest of the UK, we have mutual agreements where um, fire service, you know, they will just uh, stay in their own respective areas. They, mm -hmm. they will uh, provide mutual aid, and yes, it does drag, you know, um, resources back and forth across the various uh, respective uh, brigade boundaries. I see. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a, a big issue, and one. So you're no doubt pretty pleased to see fire prevention becoming more of a, a priority in the way so. Exactly, and um, I think one of the major issues is because uh, in regards to the reg regulation, uh, the regulation is shared by uh, three or four agencies, HSC, NWEA, the fire service in regards to life safety. So there's no one service that's taking the lead, if you like, in these, uh, in these, uh, these issues. Now with the new guidance published by the EA and the NWEA respectively, well, there should be you now uh, an improvement in the management of, uh, of these sites across the UK. But that new guidance hasn't been uncontroversial, and there are a number of aspects of it that, that do give rise to concerns for uh, waste site operators. And probably one of the, the principal ones of those has been around the issue of water supply. And I know that you know, we're potentially looking at very large volumes of water that, that people need to have access to. Is there anything you can say about, about the firefighters' perspective on why that's important and, and what people need to know about access to water in order to comply with the guidance? Well, if we start from the pretext that the, the bigger the fire, the more water it's going to it's going to um, use to, to to put the fire out. Um, generally, I know the respective guidance have minimum minimum standards of um, where water should be 
provided on site. I know that's, uh, that is contentious. Uh, but generally, from a fire service perspective, um, depending on the, on the on the size of the site, especially the larger site, they should have access to a, a good hydrant to bring me. Um, 150 mil diameter with uh, and that hydrant should be capable of delivering at least 250 mil water. That's a very good start. And um, the name of the fire service then to, to uh, put in uh, place uh, you know, the first stage of pipe in efforts. Um, if people can't, or sorry, if sites can't um, have access to those to the ring mains, then you could have access to alternative water supplies. They could be next to a harbour, for example, um, a major river. But then with that, then you could have, um, gather the necessary permissions from the from the, the person who owns that water and rights, or the water mm -hmm. undertaker, mm -hmm. or the EA, for example. And then um, they should put in place the site operators and some pre planning. How they can extract that water and form that water course. So, you know, and the, this water course could be, I don't know, a, a kilometer away, for example, or 700 meters. How are they, how are they going to put the infrastructure in place to drag that water to be used on site? Um, depending, on, again, on the size of the sites, you may have a site which is a, a large uh, water, um, water tank or a lagoon which uh, would contain a few thousand, a couple of seven thousand liters of water. Now, again, would enable the, the site operator and the fire service to initiate the uh, first stage attack at, uh, at any fire to enable in a more longer term water strategy to, to be put in place by the fire rescue service. Um, with any of these um, sites, I would suggest the first stage, or the first, uh, when you put these fire prevention plans together, is to liaise with the local fire service because, yeah, they can get on the site, you can, you can discuss them, uh, um, has this material on site, the local on site, but also what's important is, is discussing the water, how do you get water on that site? Uh, and if sites haven't got access to these alternative water supplies or hydrants, then the fire service has it in their power generally to, they may be able to amend what's called a predetermined attendance. So every call they go to, they will send um, um, a set number of resources. For a waste site, for example, they may send two appliances, you know, fire engines and a water bouncer. So because of the scarcity of water on a particular site, they may have the power then to, to amend or review that predetermined uh, attendance. And upgrade it so it include several more browsers or what's called a high volume pump. High volume pump can pump water from up to uh, I think three kilometers. So it's a fair old distance and it causes a lot of disruption. But it takes a long time to put in place. So if the when the site operators are, are putting their plans together and the with the fire then the fire service then if they get a call to that site they can uh, they can uh, put on then immediately that PDA which will include the high volume pump and they can put those things in place then should the, the incident period. So if you've got a plan, then you know what you're doing as a firefighter and your chances of, of being able to just bring the right equipment straight away are much improved. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's all about laser working together and um, if um, site operators have the confidence then to call the local fire service, come on site, we'll have a chat, look at it, the draft of fire prevention plan and the fire service will give some real good advice in regards to the fire strategy they can put in place on that site. And so, if you, from the point of view of the regulators, um, what are they saying about about the need for water? Are they sensitive to what the what the fire service is saying, or is, is there, are, are their views slightly different? So, um, the guidance stipulates in uh, both England and Wales that you need to provide 2,000 litres of water per minute for each 300 cubic metre pile of waste. Uh, obviously, many sites hold much more waste than that. Uh, the water is only for a worst case scenario, which is your largest waste pile on site. Um, so the agency want that amount of water to be available to, for the fire service to be able to use to utilise uh, on site in fighting a fire. Um, in terms of all water demand, it could actually be slightly higher by the time you've thought about installing a fire suppression system. So you may be talking about millions of litres of water on site. Obviously from an operator's perspective, um, having the infrastructure in place to maintain and deal with all of this water supply is quite significant and um, there are measures you can take um, to reduce your water demand. Uh, one that we recommend is actually looking to reduce your pile size. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean reduce the amount of material you've got on site. Uh, it could mean dividing your largest pile into two with the perhaps the use of firewalls um, which allows you to effectively half the amount of water you need on site. So whilst the agency's requirements are uh, very set out, I believe that there is some space here for alternative measures to be engaged. 
And if you can show that you've engaged with your local fire service and you've spoken to them and you have a strategy in place, you know what you're going to do. Um, there are potentially ways um, you can reduce the water requirements for your site. However, it is on a site-by-site -site basis. It will depend on the operations that you're undertaking um, and it will require liaising with the EA through your FTP application process. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think there is space to use the guidance of the fire service and obviously their advice should be respected. They are the experts in terms of fighting fires. Um, but there are, you know, there are requirements from the Environment Agency in terms of reducing the risk. Uh, and you've got to appreciate that they just want to uh, minimize site fires and if they do occur, uh, mitigate spread. So it's all about, it's balancing, it's a balancing act. Um, yeah. But to be coming up with the best solution for your site, it is really working between the agency and the local fire service. And from your point of view, Phil, I mean, just talking about this issue of pile sizes, you're happy that, um, that if you've got an effective firewall in place, um, then that is a that is a reasonable barrier that helps you in your job of, of trying to tackle fire. Well, exactly. You know, it's it's, it's all about uh, minimising the um, um, possible fire spread, and uh, as Sophie mentions, uh, the installation of, a, of an appropriate uh, third party accredited, ideally uh, fire resistant warning, you know, which with a minimum of uh, a two hours uh, uh, fire resistance would be a, a you know really good. Um, effective way of, 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 of maximizing the space on your site. And that includes for any, um, any of the, we will dis discuss uh, the quarantine area mm -hmm. a little later. But that, you know, again, there's certain sizes for the quarantine area. So if you could enclose that area within a fire existing bay, three walls, then that could be a good, you know, um, an efficient use of, 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 of yeah. much sort of space. But talking of, of space, one of the issues you face in trying to tackle at this time is um, access to and access around the site. Um, and we've talked a little bit about uh, in the past about the, the issue of um, uh, dead ends within sites and, and, and um, how to make tackling a fire as safe as possible for the uh, fire and rescue services. Is there anything to say about what's the most critical uh, for you as far as um, access to the site and how that might? Interrelate with the question of pile size. If I just paint you a picture in the first instance, that uh, if you can close your eyes now and imagine a large scrap fire, uh, which you know could be 40 by 40, for example, it's at night. Uh, there's a fire. Fire service turn up. How do you expect the fire service to apply water or to start dealing with that incident? You know, it's poor light conditions. Um, there's, a, there's a large uh, area which with, with falls and, and tip hazards and all that. So that you know, you, you, you're expecting persons to expose themselves to uh, a lot of risk um, just to put up that you know, okay, and, and not criminalise it, but just to attack the fire. So access is a real big priority for persons. You know, if they can get into uh, around the whole perimeter of the site, um, straightforward, you know, uh, with no really real barriers and it's good hard standing. Uh, for I think a fire truck is about 40 tons, for example, depending on the site, you know, depending on what it is. Uh, generally, they're about um, 3.7 meters to about 4 meters high, so 4 by 4. Um, and that that uh, space uh, availability should be a, ideally a right around the perimeter site. And the fire service shouldn't have to really travel more than say 10 to 20 meters into the heart of or into you know the the, the, uh, the uh, area which is uh, which is uh, which is on fire. Um, so yeah, um, site access is a is a big problem because you know a couple of the water. Uh, with water issue or lack of water, it can cause a, a big frustration with the fire rescue And for example, go back to the original point that you know if we if the fire rescue is about 12 o'clock at night, then they're going to directly go defensive until early hours when it starts to get light because they're not going to they're going to be very remiss of putting or something up. They're going to be reluctant, yeah, to put it, to expose their guys to to uh, hazards area when there's no risk of uh, risk of uh, light. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth pointing out there, um, as Phil mentioned, a, a, a big site with a huge waste pile. It may not have been the initial operator's site intention um, to have a waste pile that big. It might have been uh, an excep exceptional circumstance and they were planning to move it in the next couple of days. But it, this is where it's really important when you're writing your fire prevention plan to take into account not just current situations but future. Uh, when you hire, if you're working in a shed or a site and you, you have your you lay out all your bays and there's plenty of access space around everything, 
but six months on, eight months on, you're receiving more materials, your pile sizes are creeping out of their bays or tipping over the top, and then you instinctively have issues with reduced access, and then you potentially could have reduced effectiveness of firewalls, because you've got, instead of having some free board space at the top to stop the spread of fire between bays, you've ultimately just got one giant mound that's separated in the middle by concrete bays. So it's, you know, from in terms of access and power size management, it's really important to make sure that your FPP is fit for purpose, and that's not just uh, in the instant of go live. It's actually, you know, looking forwards and how your site operates perhaps in everyday circumstances, but also uh, include in exceptional circumstances where you may be receiving more waste or uh, you may not be able to get an off-taker on site to remove that waste in the day so you ultimately have more waste on site than you're initially intending. But all of these things do affect how you'd fight a fire and how the fire service would get access, so it's really worth keeping in mind. And that sort of information is going to be really helpful to, to see you included in the, the fire prevention plan. But Phil, is there any other critical information that uh, as an incident commander, you want to have on hand at the point when you arrive uh, on site? Are there any particular hazards you'd want uh, to be aware of? Well, ideally, when, when uh, uh, as an incident commander, you work to a site, um, which in the ideal world, there'll be no surprises because the site operator would have liaised with the fire service and they would have been re-familiarization with the site. So there'll be no surprises. Uh, ideally, then, the fire service then would, would, would uh, turn up with your red box on the, on the front gate of the site with a plan showing the layout of the site and all the locations of the necessary hazards, I mean hazards, LPG cylinder storage, acetylene, any other gas cutting equipment which is uh, uh, in a, either in a fire resistant box or it's at least six metres away from any fuel sources. Uh, and again showing work courses and uh, available access for that uh, site operator. And also, sorry for the site, um, when they turn up, you know, once the once you know, and they met by the by the site operator or the or the employees, and they are told there's no persons reported, they're all persons accounted for, and provided then there's no you know, if in regards to the reception procedures of the site, they should be really robust. For example, if you got ELVs, you post the ELVs, and uh, you have got scrap cars coming up of the site, they should be thoroughly inspected to make sure there's no LPG cylinders in 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 the in the, in the boot. And so if that is ideally if the site operator then has got a conference to tell this commander. My site is just, you know, it's, it's, it's just wood or it's just scrap cars. There's no LPGs or other compressed gas cylinders which are likely to fragment in the fire. The fires for them are likely to go offensive and start attacking the fire. If they can't uh, have those assurances, they will go defensive until they have further information to say exactly what's on fire. Because they, again, unless there's a life risk, they are not going to expose their guys uh, to any potential uh, source of um, fragmented. Uh, Mm. So that's a, a major hazard for, for a firefighter. Yeah, and this, the fire service then again, they've got uh, standard operating procedures to, so if they go to a site and there's a LPG or a settling cylinder which is involved in fire and it's been heated, then the fire service then will uh, default to a, um, a 25 metre in cordon where the only 500, uh, minimum 500 personnel will be allowed into in the, in the immediate instance of a responding run incident. And also they set up a 200 metre out of cordon which was a piece of police idea we looked at manage. So you can imagine that in a large urban area, the disruption that will cause, you know, again, um, the fire switch will look more for that in place if there's likely that um, any gas in that are involved in it. Mm -hmm. Right, I see that. And you talked about those two different strategies you might take on uh, arrival. What, what difference will that make as far as how the incident plays out? Uh, so if you go defensive rather than going offensive, well, if you take it literally, if, uh, offensive, yeah, you're attacking the fire, so you're working towards, you know, get, putting guys in, uh, or firefighters in, within the kind of risk area, so you're applying in the water uh, extinguishing medium onto the fire, so you're reducing the impact of that fire. If you go to fen uh, defensive, you're withdrawing, you're not attacking the fire, um, so that fire's been developed, it's going to get worse, and it will spread to maybe other buildings on site. So that, mm -hmm. that, that is the, the significant mm -hmm. difference. And the difference between which strategy you choose will not necessarily be dictated by the nature of the fire, but the information that you have on, on site and, and, the, and what's a safe approach for you to take. Yeah, ideally, again, as an incident commander, you want to go to a site and say, okay, you know, you, you, you go through like um, improving your uh, situational awareness, so you, you want to know exactly what's on fire, what's involved, 
where they find the boundaries and all that, how access, how you going to play and the extinction media. But if you've got, uh, I suspect, any compressed gas in there or other associated kind of hazard, and you're not going to commit your guys in there because um, it's just, you know, at the end of the day, it's all the bound for you. It's, 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 it's crap, it's waste, so you're not going to... <laughs> You're not going to expose you guys to, you know, mm -hmm. to that kind of uh, potential risk. And, and Sophie, th does that, um, is there a good fit between the requirements of the uh, guidance and, and what Phil's saying there about uh, people and compressed gases and other hazards? Uh, there's, there's definitely some overlap. I think it's not um, necessarily clear from the FPP guidance as to why you have to contain, uh, contain some information within your plan. So one of the requirements is to have a map showing where all the hazards are, where your water supplies are, where your buildings are, where each of your stockpiles are within on site. And that makes a lot of sense. And if you can have that in your plan up front, then that is immensely useful for fire service. In terms of the hazardous materials on site, uh, it's gas cylinders are not covered by the guidance. There is separate guidance that deals with um, the storage of gas cylinders. However, you still need to know where they are because they present a risk um, and they have the potential, if incorrectly stored, to really enhance the spread of fire within your site. Um, so whilst the guidance does not directly apply to them, you still need to consider them as a, a potential fire risk um, and take into account where you're storing them so the fire service on arrival can be uh, fully briefed on where these hazardous materials are stored um, so they can make their best informed decisions to not put more life at risk um, if it is only waste that is on fire. So let's talk a little bit about some of the impacts that a waste fire can have. Um, and maybe the first thing to talk about there is uh, sensitive receptors in the, in the immediate environment. I wonder Phil, if you can just say a little bit about the experience you have had of the what impact fire can have on, uh, on its neighbours, I suppose. Yeah, there's, uh, look, we should have a second but there's two types of uh, receptors, uh, the one being that where uh, water courses are, are contaminated by fire when runoff. So, as an instant commander, you know, you're attacking a, a fire at a, a, a scrap uh, processing area, and then it's really useful information to have uh, the, the location of um, these sensitive water receptors and, um, to, you know, available to you, so then you can put in uh, water containment strategies in place. In regards to the other type of receptor, which is uh, the local uh, community, uh, they may be a hospital or school or large house estate within one kilometer of the of the of the waste site. And I know the guidance asks for people ask for the operators to record the details of receptors. Well, the purpose of that is that yeah, you've got those details, you prioritise them in regards to the risk present in regards to the water or the area uh, contaminants. So for example, if you've got a local hospital with the half of the water, um, they use uh, air conditioning, especially in their operating theatres, you know, because they're going to make sure make, make sure the uh, uh, air recycling from it. Um, but then if you've got a large fire in a local vicinity, they could drag in contaminants and that could you know, that kind of a significant impact on, on the operational procedures within the hospital. So if you've got the, um, the contact with the hospital, as soon as you get a fire, you designate some person to make contact with the hospital or the school, give them a heads up, and then they can put a, they can put them some pre plan in place and maybe they can cancel some hospitals, uh, sorry, hospital operations, or they can they can move things around, but the essential thing being that they can initiate some pre planning and get in response to the incident at the road. And that would, you know, if I was um, if I was maybe living on a, an estate and I had heads of information about a, a developing fire, and I have to take my, keep my children inside, keep closed doors and windows, you know, okay, I won't be happy with the fire on, the, on my way set up the road, but I would be, a, you know, I'd be a lot happier than I would have been because I'd be given the heads up by, you know, if I could put yeah. something in place. So let's talk a little bit about water runoff. Um, that, that's, um, I, I think, probably an area of concern that, that's, that's grown a great deal, maybe wasn't thought about as much in, in years gone by. But, um, what what is it possible to do in order to minimise the impact of, of water runoff? Uh, what's uh, in, in preparation for an, uh, an incident like this? Well, if we just talk about a stack, for example, that's going to be put on a, an impermeable surface, and ideally that 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 stack area should be uh, provided with a bund. So then, you know, worst case scenario, you get a fire in that stack on that, that, that fuel. Uh, any water then is is um, contained within the bund area. 
so then it can be disposed of without you know, without it running off into a contaminated ground water runoff. Um, there is a possibility, and depending on the availability of local water supplies, that uh, the fire service could consider using that water to fight the fire, recycle the fire, water, recycle the water. But that will depend on obviously the type, the type of contaminant uh, which it's involved in. You know, if it's, for example, if it's contaminated with hydrocarbons, petals, uh, diesels, they would un you know, unlikely to use it. Uh, if it's too acidic, it's going to cause um, uh, harm to the uh, firefighters and the pumps, so they, they, again, they wouldn't use it. But generally, in all other instances, I would, I think the fire service would generally um, look to use our water if the water was, a, was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, provided, you know, a bit of pre plan again, uh, the site operator could put a sump in place with appropriate sieve, so then the, any recycled water wouldn't drag up any um, foreign bodies which could uh, impact on the, uh, on the, on the pumping appliances. And also, the, the uh, one thing in regards to caution is all research going into, into five or uh, using five or one or half on the uh, on the back of Bunsfield. Um, but the, generally, the more times you recycle five or water, five or water, uh, the worse it gets. So there's, a, you know, I'm going to say there's a there's a maybe a time window where you can use the recycled water before maybe a longer term water strategy depending on the size of the fire put in place. Right. So. Uh, in itself, having a, a bund and, and being able to capture some of that water runoff won't solve your water problem, but it will at least mean that that water is, is captured and it's not escaping into the environment. Yeah, that's the, I think that's the priority, to make sure it doesn't run into, into um, sensitive receptors. But also it gives the fire service an option then to use that water um, to recycle on the fire if they're struggling with water. Supply. And is that a good fit, Sophie, with the guidance for full site now? Is that, uh, yeah, so um, the, the issue with fire water containment is uh, challenging, especially when you're talking about uh, the millions of water that you might need. So not only have you got to get it onto site and be able to use it, you've then got to be able to store it if you're not recycling it. Um, there's come there's Out of the back of this fire prevention plan guidance, we've seen some really interesting, innovative solutions coming out for how you actually uh, can keep this water to stop it going into sensitive receptors. Um, ideas such as turning your car park uh, into effectively a fire water swimming pool um, so you'd have ramping access in and out and in a fire incident one of your first steps would be to make sure all of your vehicles are out of your fire uh, swimming pool so you don't uh, flood them but then assuming you can get them out within 45 minutes you can then have a draining system that directly feeds fire water from the site into a massive on-site lagoon, effectively. Um, and as Phil was saying about the fire, recycling fire water, if that is something you want to think about on your site because water supply is a significant issue, um, it really does need uh, the pre-planning up front. So you need to have the infrastructure in place to be allowing this to happen. You need to make sure with the fire service that they're happy to do it. Your local fire service might have a policy where they just don't do it. Um, and if you go on the assumption that it's all going to be OK, and they turn up and it's not, you could have a really significant fire incident rather than a small one because you're, you haven't got your water supply to put out the fire. Um, so there are many aspects of it that you need to consider. And again, if this is something they're going to do, the fire service needs to know in advance so they can bring uh, the filters so they can uh, reapply the water. Again, with the fire water, if you are reusing it, um, it does become the issue of the more you reuse it, the uh, more disgusting, shall we say, it gets. Uh, and then you've still got to dispose of that water, so you'll need to have contracts in place um, with a local disposal company to come and remove that water from your site, because you're probably most likely to find that your local sewage company are not going to want to deal with that foul, uh, foul sewer. Um, so there are many aspects that you need to consider in terms of storage of water. A, a sealed surface bonded area seems to be the most sensible. Obviously, if you're retrospectively applying that to a an area or a shed that's much more challenging than developing a new site um, but there are options and ways around it that you can consider there is a, a guidance document um, out there as well about considering what you do with your fire water runoff which is referenced in the guidance and also as i understand the guidance does say you should have a list of local sensitive receptors but doesn't really know does it no it doesn't recommend that so uh, the guidance stipulates that you have a sensitive receptor map right. within one kilometer um, but it, it, it's not that helpful in telling you what you need to do with it. Um, and that's the step that Phil filled us in about earlier, and it's really important that what it's almost like a, a stage of analysis, getting to know your neighbours 
and not just being the waste operator in the corner trying to hide away, uh, actually, you know, fronting up for the fact that you're doing this. Um, so having a list of receptors who are your key receptors within your area, a local school, a hospital, uh, perhaps if there's a, an IT industry nearby that has um, air conditioning for their servers or something, that you know, they're all industries that we take for granted and you don't want yours to be going offline because there's a waste fire nearby. So um, you need to sort of take into account and do almost a risk assessment of who's at most risk if you have a site fire and then have the procedures in place to contact them, to liaise with them and also don't just tell them there's a fire, let them know when it's out so they can stop. So yeah, sheltering is obviously important if you've got vulnerable adults or children um, around so they're not uh, inhaling all this dirty smoke thing. So waste fire can have some pretty profound local economic impacts, and not just within the site, but on the local value more generally. Yeah, if your site's next to a motorway and uh, your smoke plume becomes significant, it's not a waste site, but um, Phil mentioned Buntsfield, uh, that was a fuel site that exploded, uh, I think, 10, 15 years ago now, and it shut the M1 for days. Uh, and obviously the economic impact of shutting the motorway is quite significant, and you definitely don't want to be the person with that waste site. And obviously, once you get into talking about businesses losing money and stuff, you've always got the possibilities of litigation mm -hmm. um, as they want to get their money back off of somebody. So you could have some pretty substantial liabilities coming your way. Yeah, it could get a little bit tricky. Um, again, another reason to reduce your risk. So we've talked a bit about the importance of, of liaising with your local fire service in preparing your plan and, and uh, uh, trying to get their input. Uh, is that something that, that generally fire services are, are willing and interested uh, to do? Is that is that the challenging thing to, to do? And how how could people best engage with their local fire service? Well, the fire service, the, as you can imagine, the, the predominantly in, uh, in in urban areas. Within that urban area, you're going to have lots of different types of risk, lots of industrial processes, for example. So, in order to um, for the fire service to deal more efficiently and to make sure that uh, they protect the health and safety of, of their guys, the, the five others. They will carry out um, what's called site statistic risk information visits. Uh, SSRI is, is called uh, Central Duty under the Fire Services Act, but it's, uh, it's a statutory duty, and the fire services will, will prioritize the, what they perceive as the risk areas within their site, and then they'll arrange a series of visits. Uh, they call um, you know, new familiar, say, new visits these sites. So they, you know, there's no surprises basically when they turn up to these sites. The building relationships with the, the site owners, site you know, the guys in charge, and they um, they can they can you know list they they, can, they all got PCs on, on their trucks, NDTs, and they can put you know for any any particular site with with, uh, with hazards on. They will have um, ideally have gone there. They will have done a bit of an inventory, and then those hazards would be recorded on the, on the IT system on on the pump on the tunnel system. When they're en route to the assistant place, and then they look, they look quickly up and say, okay, what are the risks? And then they lose that information and inform the dynamic risk assessment mm -hmm. the curve, and that will be created and they go offensive, or they go defensive, or, uh, but then the equation, if, if, uh, if people are involved in the site, then you know, that, that would be the priority. Um, and you can have to save them, like, but, you know, apart from that, then you use information, well, use that information to inform the, the dynamic risk assessment. Mm -hmm. But yes, a big part of the price is uh, day, day to day you know, is it's just doing that initial pre-planning that helps to avoid incidents arising later. Yeah, and also you know, as a site if I you know, if I was a site operator, I would uh, make full use of my local fire to do this. I I uh, get them on site, make them a couple of teas, biscuits. And when I drafted drafted my fire prevention mm -hmm. mitigation plan, I would ask them would they you know, would they have be happy to uh, exercise on the site. So that's you know you're really giving your your plan a uh, real robust testing, and then. They could be involved in the fire, you know, the fire guys, uh, fire defense commander, and be involved in the real route process, we go process and to make sure that yeah, my product, the fire prevention plan for that particular site is fit for purpose and it's been tested by the fire service. Yeah. And that's that's going to give you a pretty robust plan once you've been through that process. Exactly. So you know, you you I suppose you're killing two birds with one stone. You know, you you're addressing the issue of providing a, a fit for purpose fire prevention mitigation plan, but also getting fire service on type because you know. When uh, during the incident occurred on site, who's in the plan with the fire service? So you know, the better working relationship and the better things you can put in place to assist their job, you know, the better for everybody. And that's not something that's required in the guidance, but it's 
possibly something that, that's useful for operators to know. Yeah, so the guidance um, doesn't at any point say you should talk to your fire service. Um, we would recommend it, but it's uh, a little bit dependent to where you're located, to the level of engagement you'll get from your fire service. Um, it seems that the situation in Wales does seem slightly more advanced um, than that in England, from my experience. Um, but if you can, if once you've got your foot in, however you get it in, um, actually talking to your fire service, and they might flag an issue that you've not even thought about yet, or they could they could uh, come up with a solution that you haven't thought about. So it's really worth you know getting them on site early on, once you've had a, a bit of a think about your risks, but early on to start to pick their brains about how they might tackle a fire on your site, and then you can use that information to feed into your fire prevention plan. And then, as Phil said, you know, you can, if there is an incident and they turn up on site, they've been there before, they know what's going on. Obviously, they're more likely to come to your site if you're a big operator with big stockpiles. Um, they'll probably focus on high-risk sites rather than others. Mm -hmm. And you've always got that issue of competing priorities. You know, we all live in big urban towns, and nobody will want too much fire resource being diverted to going to look at waste sites that might never set a light um, compared to... Um, helping somebody in a road traffic collision, so you know you, it's a cha it's a challenging job for them to balance all their responsibilities. Um, but there are ways to get engaged with your local fire service, and I think it's definitely an invaluable step um, in getting the right solution in place for your site, and also to you know understand, uh, as we're talking to Phil today, understand how the fire service deal with these things can be enlightening to how you actually propose a solution to the EA. So I'm just going to take the, this opportunity to remind our listeners that if they do have any questions, uh, please do submit them using the questions box in the panel on the right of the screen. Um, but what, one further thing we might talk about is um, it, what should operators actually do with their fire prevention plan? Where should they keep it? What, what should they be doing as far as um, alerting um, the fire service to this concern? <coughs> once they've, um, they've dra drafted the fire prevention location plan, then obviously they're going to test it to make sure it's a safe process. And ideally, you get a person involved so they can come along and, and, and be involved in that review process and then you, you make the necessary adjustments. It's important then that, that the, the draft of a, the plan is not just put on the shelf from PC uh, and forgotten until maybe you know, two years down the line or you're on fire, for example. You know, it should be treated as a continued live document. Uh, any changes should be reviewed, incorporated within the document, and new people come on site. You know, Management processes, for example, managing, you know, people designated with specific responsibilities in regards to the plan should be made aware of what they what they what their role is. It should be trained, and also that um, it should be kept in, a, in an appropriate place where, if we touch wood, there's no fire. But if there is a fire, if one of the fires is enough, it's not, you know, the, the site officer would say, oh, I've got it. It's on a PC in the office, which is maybe affecting the fire. So ideally, as I think as Sophie mentioned earlier on, red box. With uh, maybe the whole plan, but also the front camera, then well, I need to know A4 page, nice and bright colours, the fire is like bright colours, a uh, good you know, plan on the, on the site uh, available to, 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 to the fire to use that in, in, in the risk assessment process. I think that's something that is really important. What should your fire prevention plan look like to actually be useful? Um, I think you know, there's a tendency to respond to guidance in a very line by line kind of way. and to end up with a very thick, very robust looking document that practically might not be all that useful. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's really important that, that, it, that um, again, I think, so if you mentioned earlier, that it's, that it's fit for purpose. Nobody wants to see a document 50 to 60 pages long. So, and also, what, what in my experience, that um, uh, most of that plans to the NRW where I, I have plans in which were a mishmash or uh, because uh, fire safety, regularly fire safety uh, risk assessment. And also the fire prevention mitigation plan, and uh, trying to pick the bones of that was really uh, challenging. So, in regards to the fire safety order, uh, risk assessment which is required for sites, that should be a separate document. In regards to the, you know, we should be four separate documents, but they are obviously they are the crossovers uh, in regards to training, but they are generally two separate documents, and they shouldn't be uh, treated as a mishmash. Was you know, I'm not the brightest uh, X5 in the world, but I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really put a, a cohesive them together, um, I just kept the both separate. Yeah. I think it's really important, um, it, it's not, 
The guidance doesn't suggest this, but in our experience of writing plans, there's many elements that you're trying to pull together. So there's different procedures that you're having to incorporate into your plan, um, like a firefighting procedure. Um, there's also sort of waste acceptance procedures that you're talking about. Then you're looking at risk assessments for the materials you've got on site. Then you're looking at material storage requirements and limits. And then you're talking about what the EA wants in terms of just the ultimate thing is you just want your permit. Uh, and actually balancing those three elements, what do you want as an operator, what does the fire service want, and what does the EA want, is tricky. Um, and actually dividing the documents up so they are fit for purpose, not just for getting your permit, but for actually day-to-day -day operations, is really important. And it says in the, in the guidance itself that it actually forms part of your management system. But intrinsically, it sits as its own kind of document, which overlaps a lot of things. And it's, it's a bit awkward in nature. Um, so it's really important that you're clear on what your document's doing and what bits of your document do what. So if you have a new member of staff start, which are the key bits for them to read? You know, what what training do you need to give them? What procedures do they need to know about? They don't necessarily need to know about what suppression system is and what spec of your walls are. They don't necessarily need to do, know that to do their job. But that's the kind of information you need to include to get your, your permit from the EA. So it is a sort of a balancing act, and I don't think the guidance necessarily provides uh, the best structure in developing a document which is useful for all purposes. I think that's one of the key takeaways from it, that what we're talking about here is a document that serves three different purposes, and it needs to be written so as to, to play each of those roles effectively. As, as you said, there's getting the permit, there's operating the site, and there's dealing with an actual incident, mm. and, and the audience, audience I suppose, are really pretty different from one another. Yeah, really different, and obviously the requirements for each are so varied, and you don't want to cloud other people's judgment by giving them information they don't need. Um, so in terms of keeping your operations as simple as possible to eliminate the misunderstanding and potential risks, um, it is really important to, to get your document right. Um, for you as well as an operator, you don't want this cumbersome document that you have to review every six to twelve months, and it's really inconvenient to do so. It's about getting it right for you. You don't want to be restricted. You know, you don't want to write procedures that effectively tie you in knots, but just get your permit. Um, so they're all things that actually the process of writing a fire prevention plan needs to take into account. And is the guidance, um, does the guidance support you in doing that, or is that something that uh, you kind of need a bit of extra help to, to be able to understand? I think to make a document that is really easy to use for all parties, uh, following the guidance almost in a step-by-step -step stage isn't uh, the way I would go about it. It's not the way I go about it. Um, so it wouldn't be my recommendation. But it, it's got all the information you need, but not necessarily in the format to make it most usable. Um, to all three parties. Well, I think that has covered a lot of ground. Um, um, unless there are any last questions from our from our audience members, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll bring this to a close. But before we uh, finish, I'll just remind you that we'll be back in two weeks' time. Um, when uh, so, this is not your last opportunity to, to ask any questions. Uh, if you would like to pose any questions, uh, please do contact us via Emma Howe. Uh, oh, hang on, we've got a question coming through. Is somebody coming in under the under the wire? Um, so, we've been asked for a top tip um, uh, as to as to how to prepare a, a fire prevention plan. Is there is there something that either Phil or, or Sophie could say about uh, you know, the, the, the one top tip? Well, well, from my perspective, it would be liaise with an open fire rescue service if they if they had just condensed it in one tip. So there's a number of issues in regards to the uh, formulation of a, of a fire prevention mitigation plan. Thanks to the top tip on a chart by rescue service, invite them along and uh, get their opinion on, on, on their website. Um, mine would be to make sure that you start with how you operate. So don't necessarily look at how what the guidance is asking you to do, but actually start by reviewing how you currently do things and then looking at how you can bring those up to the standards that are required. I think sometimes when you read the guidance for the first time, it's, it's asking a lot of you. But ultimately, you probably do these things in all sorts of different ways at the moment. It's just maybe not formalised in the type of policy or procedure document that they're after. So, it, it, yeah, don't be freaked out, I think, by the guidance. Um, 
and work bottom up um, and make sure it works for you because there is such a risk that you design something just to get your permit and it's actually either financially undoable because it undermines your business model or the suppression kit you're talking about getting in is far too expensive. But equally, you know, it could be that it just doesn't work for you. So make, yeah, make sure that you, you keep yourself in mind and aren't just trying to appease the agency. Yeah, I think that's that's really important that, that you've got to, to focus on this as part of business operations, not you know something that you just uh, stick on top, but something that you integrate with the way that you operate your site. Yeah, completely. Also, can I just add one? Oh, please do. Yeah, make sure that. Um, uh, they should, whatever they're going to do, if they can invest any 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 uh, suppression systems, they should consult with the insurer in the first instance because that may not fit, be fit for purpose in regards to the insurance issue. Yeah, yeah I and mean, that's also a question where we haven't talked a great deal about insurers. We did touch on, on the role of insurers and, and uh, the way that a fire prevention plan and, and the action you might take to implement a fire prevention plan could help with your insurance situation. Uh, that's something that we we covered quite a bit in the first of the series of, of webinars, which uh, you can uh, download by accessing it from our website or uh, from our YouTube channel. So um, I think that's where we'll, we'll call things to a halt. As I said, we will be back in two weeks' time, and you can submit uh, questions to Emma Howe, whose email address uh, you should have from the invitation you've received. Um, but in, uh, until then, thank you for joining us, uh, and we look forward uh, to uh, with us again uh, in two weeks' time.